Do we have a mouse? Do we have a mouse? Huh? Hold on. He said there's a clicker. Do you have a clicker that will forward it? I'll stand, I'll stand at the podium. I can see it. But we need a laser, laser pointer. Let it be known that this is the eighth International Family Allergeal Alliance Symposium. And just like the first, we're going to use a big, long stick to point to the slide, <laughs> which we did in Milwaukee, Oregon because laser pointers cost a lot of money and you couldn't just go to the desk and get one. Anybody in here have a laser pointer in their pocket? All right, we're going on hold for two minutes. Thank you everybody, everybody for coming. <laughs> throw, your pe throw your pen at it, David. So welcome everyone, my name is Roberta. I'm the president of the Allergy Syndrome Alliance. I'm so grateful all of you had I have uh, made the trip here, and not only that, we understand that this is truly an investment. It's uh, a, not a cheap thing for our families to come here, and so we understand uh, the hardship that that can cause on our families, and uh, so please know that we acknowledge that, and we are grateful that you're here, and that you've taken the time and the finances to participate, and we hope that you will learn everything that you could possibly learn, soak it all in, and go home and let this be a life-changing um, experience for you. So welcome to the 8th International Symposium on Allergy Syndrome. And we also had a scientific meeting yesterday, which was just amazing. If any of you were there, outstanding lineup. And we also got a PCORI, um, it's a Eugene Washington Award that allowed us for the first time ever to have what's called a research round table. So for the entire morning, um, Cher Bork, our executive director, ran this research round table, which is really to bring the patient voice to your voice, here to um, push the envelope a little bit on what we wanna do in research, what we wanna do in science, help our pharma companies, help our biotech companies, and, and start making a difference in what's happening. Right now we have more allergial science than we've ever had, and it's a great opportunity. So all of you that are here today, take the opportunity to talk to our scientists that are here and the biotech and the pharmaceutical companies and get to uh, make conversations with the people around you because you never know what your story might do to impact the work that they're doing. So thank you so much, and thank you to Cher Bork, who did the research roundtable today. Um, I share, wave in the back. Share's been with us. Yeah. Share's been with us now for over a year, and she's knocking it out of the park as the executive director, and we couldn't be more happy um, with that. So before we get, before we really get started, I do want to let you all know that this is a really unique symposium for us because. We have created a family conference, not only for the allergial uh, families here, but also for another rare disease state for PFIC families. So uh, I would like to introduce Emily Ventura from the PFIC network, wherever she is, stand up. Come on up, Emily. So in September of 2018, Emily and a couple a couple moms with PFIC started a nonprofit organization. We're in our 26th year at the Alliance. We know how difficult it is. So we have taken them under our wing. We have invited them, created an entire three-day family conference that really commingles with what the Elegial Syndrome Conference is doing. 
Their main room is downstairs and they'll also join in with some of our breakouts or deep dives during the, during the weekend. And I just wanna take the opportunity to you know, thank you, Emily, for being open to joining uh, our symposium and creating your own family conference. So I'll give you a, a few minutes to talk to your families as well. Oh boy. Uh, okay, well I need to start off by thanking Roberta and Cher and everybody at the Algeals Alliance. Um, this, as Roberta said, we just started, um, we just achieved our nonprofit back in September 2018, so it's been less than a year. Um, having a family conference was part of our long-term goals. We never imagined that we would have all of us together in one place within the first year, and it's been an incredible opportunity. Um, it's been a need for our community for quite some time. Um, and so a really, really big thanks to Algeals for opening their arms, um, allowing us to join, mentoring us through this entire process and kind of bearing with us as we navigate the waters here. Um, and then another large thanks to our presenting sponsor, um, Alvareo Pharmaceuticals and our supporting sponsor, Miram Pharmaceuticals, um, for providing us the opportunity to sponsor our families to attend the conference because without that sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to be here. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. And piggybacking on that, we had some tremendous sponsors. This is the first time ever that we're in the green after a symposium, and, and I can't thank you, uh, all of those who helped us financially to achieve that. It's, it's unbelievable. These conferences cost upwards of $150,000. And without the help of our donors, families like you who are doing fundraisers for us, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, some of our partners, we would not be able to do this. So I would like to give a huge, huge thank you out to our presenting sponsor here for Miram Pharmaceuticals. If I can have all our Miram folks stand up. Thank you so, so much. And we also have, um, and actually Miram gave us a very generous travel scholarship for our families, and that allowed an additional 12 to 13 families to come here. And without that sponsorship, we would be, you know, much less in this room. So thank you so, so much for that. Uh, we also have great sponsorships from Albareo. If our Albareo folks would stand up, if they're in, the in here. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Retrofin, where's our Retrofin team? Maybe not, anyway. oh, we got one, we got one. We also got a really great um, scholarship, or a, uh, um, grant from uh, Global Genes, which is really cool, it was a $5,000 scholarship grant to bring another family here, and we did bring an international family with that grant, we couldn't be more thankful. So Ashley E, wherever you are from Global Genes, thank you so much for that. And, yeah, so I'm telling you the list keeps going because we, uh, I got an Italian handshake for, for a, a grant from David Piccoli back there and it was probably the best Italian handshake I've ever had. He, he agreed and then we had a little standoff with sponsorship between CHOP and Stanford Children's Health. So thank you all, all of you for that. Sand for Research, who we have um, lots of scientists there that we uh, just absolutely love, and we also partner with them for our CORDS uh, registry, so thank you for that, and Arcturus Ther Therapeutics. Thank you so much. So, I guess we're gonna kick it off with David Piccoli coming up. David's gonna kick our, our, uh, our symposium off with a where we were, where we are, and where we're going. Thank you, Roberta. David, I do have to cut you off five minutes before five. I just want to inform you, although you're yes. in charge, Benita has ceded to me 15 minutes of her time. She said it'll take me that long to figure out which clicker is which. All right. You can tell I work with a tough crowd. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here at the eighth symposium. I've uh, uh, been to all eight, and this is uh, far and away the best for a whole bunch of uh, reasons. Um, but probably uh, uh, the biggest single reason is that I think there is now so much research going on, so much understanding about Notch Pathway, 
support from the NIH for children, which we'll talk, children with a capital C, um, which we'll talk a little bit about. And, and so there really are things that we can talk about where we're going. I think the, the last seven symposia, it's mostly where have we been and where are we now. So, um, aha. So I thought probably nothing more fitting. There, there are people here who have infants. There are people here who have lived through Allergil as an adult, and there are people who are here who are adults but have never been symptomatic but um, came into the Allergil warrior family um, because they had a child. So this, uh, for Nancy, Kathy, Benita, and for me, this is a family on the uh, East Coast that has hosted uh, an allergial picnic for like 26 years in a row, minus one year. And this little guy, um, okay, I'm still a little techno challenged. Okay, there we are. You can see uh, at birth, one of twins um, going along. And he was one people have talked about um, you know, can you have a Kasai and, and uh, you know, what does that mean for life? We'll see there's a lot of pictures. He had a Kasai. Um, he had a lot of challenges. I think you can see, you know, the scratch marks and things. A great, very supportive family, which we think is critically important. A G-tube, which allowed all those uh, nasty meds to be uh, administered in 10 seconds rather than 10 hours. And uh, he obviously grew up. You'll see this picture again. Um, he was, loved to give us pictures of him in various things. He did also, well, I'll, I'll get to that, around this point in time, he has a transplant. And uh, uh, in recognition of his uh, transplant success, when he was discharged, he took a couple of rolls of toilet paper. And while I was in clinic seeing patients, uh, toilet papered my entire office, uh, and I'm so sad that I don't have a picture of that because it was really extraordinary, and he was so proud. Um, but he continues to grow up. He did have a transplant. Um, he's now uh, nearly middle-aged, I would say, um, but very successful in every way. And in going through all of those uh, very significant challenges, uh, made it and uh, you know, has uh, come through uh, to the other side. And you can see that some of these are, he is really older than this, but I didn't get the next picture. So where he's been, where he is, where he's going um, is I think a, a good, uh, you know, sort of uh, story uh, for all the things that we're going to talk about. So it's kind of interesting in a way, more or less with a little bit of fudging, that the Notch story is about 100 years old or as Dr. Anderson, the scientist, corrected me, it's 102 years old. Um, but we had no connection between Notch and, and uh, uh, Allergil syndrome for a very long time. But we also had no good understanding for a long time of pediatric liver diseases. And so back in the beginning, these were all rare. Most of them had no cause, no understanding, and no good therapy. And it was really, this is, Daniel Allergil, who was a French hepatologist, a French liver doctor, and he was the first person who took from this morass of uh, diseases that had bile duct paucity, and we'll talk about that. Um, he was the first to recognize that a large percentage of his patients in, in France actually had syndromic features. They had a heart murmur. He thought their face looked a, a little bit different, um, and he really unbelievably well described this syndrome. And you can see 50 years ago, and I'm going to say exactly 50 years ago. Um, and since that time, we've learned a tremendous amount. But he was really the one who, who brought this forward. And he did not like the idea of calling this allergial syndrome. This, this syndrome, if you go back in the literature, has had all kinds of names. Um, but it's only more recently that we've uh, uh, affixed his name to it in a way that really um, sort of gives recognition to the fact 
He was a brilliant, brilliant physician. He cared a lot about families. He was one of the first people to set up a, a family care system outside of what was a teeny little hospital that then became the liver powerhouse for, for much of Europe. So a lot of credit to Dr. Alagil. So this is bile duct paucity, just, and this, when Alagil defined this, you had to have paucity to have this syndrome. The syndrome was called syndromatic paucity of the interlobular bile ducts. So paucity means a lack of, and for the hepatologist, a lack of bile ducts. So here's a big portal tract. This is the plumbing in between all of the liver cells. And what you have here is arteries and veins, but the portal tract is a triad, and the third member in that portal tract is bile ducts. And there's no duct plumbing here, so there's nothing to drain the bile here. And for a long time, all these different things were either associated with paucity or caused paucity, but he was the one who really pulled out of this um, the syndrome itself. The scientists talk a little bit about are we, are we saying the number of ducts per portal tract, the number of portal tracts per pound of liver? Those are important things scientifically. But for people who had a biopsy early on in their course, what we were looking for was, are there too many ducts? That's proliferation. That's biliary atresia. Is there hepatitis? That's all these other infections and some of the Fick diseases and other things. Or is there paucity? which is usually Allergyl syndrome, because these guys mostly are way, way rarer than Allergyl syndrome. So what is Allergyl syndrome? It's a highly variable disease that's characterized because we're liver doctors. We think the world starts with the liver, and then it goes to all the other organs. So bile duct paucity associated with a lack of flow, and that lack of flow, that's the term cholestasis, stasis, no flow, choli, bile, okay? Aphases, there should be a T on that, heart disease or murmur, pulmonary artery, um, and a bunch of other things that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and so I think everybody in here is familiar with the, the overview. What causes it? Um, well, for a very long time, in, in my career at least, we didn't uh, know, I call that the pre-Nancy era, uh, but mutations in JAGED1 uh, that codes for a protein in the notch signaling pathway. It was a surprise uh, when it was discovered. It wasn't exactly what we were thinking. It turned out scientifically to be so much more important than a lot of other things. Allergio recognized that it's dominantly inherited. That means that you only need one bad copy of a gene and it also means, and this is really important scientifically, you have one good copy of the gene. So a lot of the things that the scientists are now looking at is how do we take one good copy and make it work a little harder, and what are the things that that might do to fix things? And we'll talk about that at the end if we get to the, through the next 91 slides. Okay, a small percentage of allergial syndrome we discovered later, and we'll see some things are due to mutations in a different gene, but it's in the same pathway. It's a first cousin. Um, and that's a much less common, but uh, also very important. So because this is the family part, we should talk a little bit about some of the big picture things. So what does the liver actually do? It makes a whole bunch of body proteins. A lot of these are the things that we measure um, when you come in to see us in the office, the clotting proteins and the albumin are most important. But there's a huge number of things that the liver sends out into the body. It also purifies or detoxifies the blood. So one of the things it does is it pulls the precursors of bilirubin and sends them out into our stool. Um, but the liver is, we, really is like a very sophisticated, elegant, beautiful kidney because it does a whole bunch of things and then excretes into the stool, and we don't usually think of that. We usually think of stool and food and so on, um, but it's, it's a very sophisticated metabolic factory, um, and it gets rid of and detoxifies a whole bunch of things. And then it's also involved in body regulation. So when your liver fails, it's very hard to keep a person healthy and out of the ICU because it's doing all of this metabolic regulation. 
So what is the structure of the liver? Um, we saw with uh, Dr. Anderson uh, yesterday some beautiful real pictures. This is a medical illustrator, uh, Netter. Um, and what you can see is there's a whole bunch of liver cells, and they're arranged in this unbelievable honeycombed arrangement. And in that, the blood vessels are very uh, tightly arranged, and there's an artery, and there's a vein. And then every single cell drains. These are in green, and they're not, not in real life. But every single cell drains from its margins and goes into bigger and bigger ducts, and those ducts communicate into these ducts, and they go down, and eventually down here is your gallbladder, and then it goes into your duodenum part of your bowel. So this is very complicated organization, but the pipes, the plumbing, are extremely important in this. This is it in cross-section rather than in 3D, and what you're seeing here are ducts, and they're draining, um, from the liver into the portal area, and then they go down and they come out of the liver. So that's the anatomy, and that's what's wrong in Alagil syndrome. It's those small ducts that are draining every single cell that are communicating between the canaliculi, which are those things on the edges of every cell, getting down to the, the bigger ducts. Okay, so what is paucity? Paucity means that you don't have enough of those draining uh, pipes to take away the bile. So the liver cells are working, they're making bile correctly, but they can't pump it into the pipes, so a lot of things back up into the blood. So it's just like if your sink is stopped up. And so some of those things that back up into the blood, one of them obviously is bilirubin, which is why people are jaundiced, but other things that back up include cholesterol and bile salts, and those are some of the things associated with itching and so on. Okay. So how common is allergial syndrome? The numbers flip a little bit um, depending on how you count it, and we still, Kathy, Nancy, and I still fight about syndrome versus mutation because Nancy has always tried to convince me unsuccessfully that if you have a mutation, but there's nothing wrong with you, you don't have the syndrome. And I sort of feel like if you could have a baby with the syndrome and you have a mutation, you have the syndrome. But we, there's a lot of things we will never agree on. What you can see, and this came up a lot in talking today, is that, and we recognize allergial much more now than we did 25 years ago, okay? But biliary atresia is just way more common. It's very dramatic. The physical examination is very dramatic. Um, but this is the reason, and we talked a little bit about the fact, biliary atresia, you have to make the diagnosis in a timely fashion. Allergil syndrome, if the diagnosis is delayed by two weeks, it's upsetting, obviously, and sometimes two months or two years. But it isn't that there was a specific therapeutic event that would be life-saving that you missed whereas biliary atresia, you have to go to that surgery quickly. So there are some times where people haven't been able to tell things apart. You do the surgery, and then you find out later on it was actually allergial, not biliary atresia. Um, okay. So what's a typical scenario? And I think you all know this, a heart disease or a heart murmur, liver disease in the neonatal period or later on, poor growth, malabsorption, problems in other organs. We have patients who presented with neonatal kidney failure, and then it turned out to be allergial syndrome. In fact, the, the boy that I showed you all the pictures of was a renal patient before he became a, a liver patient. And then from a lab point of view, elevated bilirubin, liver enzymes, and duct enzymes. So we focus a lot on the GGT, and that's a big clue in infancy, because there are only a couple of diseases, one of the fix, um, uh, and uh, allergial and biliary atresia that have a really high GGT in the first couple weeks of life. So, all right. So how is it diagnosed? I think uh, some of you had the traditional pathway. Some of you had what we might call the alternative uh, pathway. Um, but a typical approach would be for a liver allergial patient um, that you have jaundice, you go through a sequence that includes some blood work, 
an ultrasound. Many times you get a Synta scan, a Decida scan, or a Hida scan. We feel an important step in that sequence is a liver biopsy, and then you go to the operating room, you get a cholangiogram, and if the cholangiogram is open, it could be allergial. If it's closed, it's biliary atresia. But the key thing is that the liver biopsy, there's all the way on the right, it's proliferation. You have to go to the OR. That's going to be biliary atresia, might be allergial. All the way on the, my left, bile duct paucity, don't ever go to the OR. Because once the surgeon gets into the OR, it's very hard to tell apart. So it's really the liver doctor's job to say patients should go to the OR or not. And then there are just some in the middle where you just can't tell, and everybody's just trying to be really careful and doing a biopsy, doing a cholangiogram, and so on. OK. So Allergio recognized some very specific criteria. And we'll talk about this a little bit, because he was so on the money with this. It's really amazing. But because he defined this syndrome the way he did, everybody who had the diagnosis for 20 or more years was a definite. But there were a whole bunch of people, and we'll show you some of the work that uh, uh, Benita led uh, with Nancy that shows that Allergil's definition is the tip of the iceberg. And then there are a whole bunch of other people who don't meet these criteria, but they have a partial syndrome, if Nancy will forgive me, or less penetration, less effect of the gene, but they really still have the same thing. They're just not as affected. Okay? So we talked about what cholestasis is. It's that lack of bile flow and all the toxins and bad things that the liver is supposed to get rid of. So these are some pictures of cholestasis, and some of you have, have, have lived it. One of the things that happens is that you can get lipid deposits. We say cholesterol, but it's probably more complicated than that. And they have a tendency to be very significant in hands and feet, places that get trauma. Um, and this even, you know, this, so this woman probably, a girl at the time, uh, probably had 2,000 xanthomas. And many people, most people with xanthomas, also have pruritus. And usually we say it's not exact, that on the way up, when your cholesterol goes above 500, you're going to start getting xanthomas. And when your cholesterol sort of comes back down, if you're in that lucky group where it comes back down, for whatever reason, but sometimes it happens spontaneously, the xanthomas soften up and, and eventually can totally go away. And uh, this now woman, uh, this is her and this is her. She did not have partial external diversion. She did not have a transplant. She had medical therapy. And you can see they all went away. And she literally had thousands. So it's not to say that that happens with everybody. It happens. OK. What does cholestasis mean to us? I think this is the list. And I, I think, Roberta, you're giving these slides out, right? Yeah, yeah, OK. So nobody, you don't really have to like go crazy and take notes, because you'll get these. Um, but bilirubin, bile salts, we measure this thing called alk phosphatase, alkaline phosphatase. Pediatricians don't pay as much attention to that. The GGT, the cholesterol. And you know that the cholesterol in allergial syndrome can be, so uh, adults, you know, if mine gets over 200, I get yelled at. Um, in allergial syndrome, it can be 1,000. It can be 1,500. That was the range where that girl's was when she had all of those uh, xanthomas. Um, xanthomas, that's not a, a blood test. That's a physical sign. Pruritus, you certainly know. That's itching. Um, but also we have because, so there's a, a pathway, cholesterol, which we make and which is really essential. You just don't want too much of it. Cholesterol can be made into a whole bunch of really important other compounds, including some of the hormones. But it also is made into something called bile salts. And the bile salts have a reason, which is not to torture everybody. It's that the bile salts are the detergent in our gut when the liver makes them and excretes them that allows us to absorb fat. 
And so without those bile salts in our gut, we would have tremendous fat malabsorption and people would have a hard time surviving, particularly in infancy, where the fluids that we get, breast milk formula and so on, really have like 50% of their calories are from fat. So you need to be able to absorb fat, and that's what bile salts do. You also need a couple of other things. You need a pancreas, you need salivary glands, other things. But it's the, the bile salts take like the drops of oil that would be in an Italian salad dressing, and they disperse them so that they spread out in a way that the body can absorb them. So they're really critical for absorption of fats and also the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And most allergial patients don't have a problem with A, and I think, you know, Benita Kamath said this morning that one of the preps has too much A and too little E, um, but D, E, and K can be tremendous problems. And sometimes a patient, for some reason, can absorb this one and this one, but not this one. Um, but sometimes people need a thousand-fold more of those fat-soluble vitamins to get normal level levels. Okay. So I'm just going to go quickly through some of these. These are unrelated uh, children who live near Philadelphia and actually don't live very far apart from each other, um, but they look like siblings. And you can see the, the triangular-shaped uh, head with a little bit of a pointy chin and so on. As someone said uh, over there uh, before, it, it's really hard or impossible to see this in a newborn, um, even when we're like overly sensitized to it. Um, this uh, is pictures of adults, and, and so Ian Krantz um, in our group, and sometimes known as Nancy's husband, um, did a study, he's a geneticist, and he took a bunch of pictures and showed them to geneticists, and they were really good with the pediatric picture, and uh, they were terrible with the adult picture. Um, because the face totally changes structure and the chin comes out and the head shape changes and everything. But they look like each other and they're very recognizable. And, and of course, at both ends of the age spectrum, people look normal. It's not like some other syndromes, um, but a characteristic structure. Okay, so here's our guy back. He did uh, sell us this picture. Um, and he's old enough that this was back when we did growth curves with a pen on paper. Um, but you could see he was really failing. He started NG tubes. He got a G tube put in, started to get his meds and so on, and eventually got closer and closer to the curve. And as, as someone said, this is, this is the normal, regular American growth curve. We did make that allergial growth curve, which is as good as we have for now. It's very different, um, and it's reasonable to plot your child on both of them. All right, so these are some of the bone findings, and this is a, a spine, and there is a butterfly-looking thing here, a butterfly vertebrae, but what you actually see, and this is a CAT scan of multiple spinous bones, is this one's kind of normal, this one's ratty on the edge, this one's almost butterfly, this one's butterfly, a whole bunch of different things. And so what we see in allergial syndrome, and um, one of our parent speakers today said, the more you go on, the more things I accumulate, the more things they find in allergial syndrome after allergial described it, like for the next 15 years, every paper, little case reports, oh, and they also get this, oh, and they also get this. So actually from a bone point of view, there are a whole bunch of different bony abnormalities, but the one that counted for diagnosis was the butterfly vertebrae. Um, in the eye, the same thing. Um, posterior embryotoxin is this little line here, and actually, although it has a great name and everybody oohs and ahs about it, it's really relatively meaningless. There are some other optic abnormalities that are more meaningful, and then a whole bunch of other things, sometimes congenital, but sometimes due to vitamin deficiency and so on. So th even the eye is incredibly complex, although most patients' eyes are not a clinical issue, although the ophthalmologist probably tell you to come back every six months for the rest of your life, because they look at these. <laughs> the heart disease is really, really important, um, and so many patients, so in the English language, so Allergiel wrote his first paper in French, um, with, which uh, Dr. Jutel could read, but nobody in America read, you know, and it wasn't, nothing was electronic back then, so, you know. He wrote the paper in the English language in 75, 
that had everybody go, wow, by that point in time, he had vastly expanded things. In the meantime, some other guys in the English language had written a paper on arteriohepatic dysplasia, pulmonary artery stenosis. Oh, and by the way, they have liver disease. So it's your perspective. They cared about the heart disease. The liver was like, eh, you know. But they did also describe Allergil syndrome before Allergil did in the English language. Um, but it turns out that the cardiac disease is really very important. And probably the single most important thing in an allergial infant's life is the question of whether they have tetralogy of Fallot or pulmonary atresia or one of the pulmonary atresia variants because those are very tough cardiac lesions. And so for the early part of allergial syndrome, those were essentially always fatal. Um, because not only are those very tough right-sided lesions, but then you commonly had resistance to flow up, up the tree, downstream on the pressures, so the right heart really had to do some unbelievable things. The surgical techniques for this have gotten much, much better, um, and you know, so there have been a lot of advances. But you know, if you have a, a VSD now or an ASD, um, nobody in cardiology would say that they were trivial, but they would say, these are just standard things, we'll take care of this. Sometimes you don't even get open surgery for those. So uh, you'll have some uh, uh, more talk about this, but this was not something that struck Allergil very much, but now um, we totally recognize that this pathway is very active in blood vessel development, and many blood vessels in many different systems can be extremely important and can be narrowed and can cause hypertension, can cause strokes, can cause other very significant challenges. And, and this, uh, this information all came uh, significantly later as people uh, had better imaging techniques and so on. So we're going now way back to the beginning. So these are a couple of major liver centers. Um, this one is uh, CHOP, this one's UCLA, this is Allergil's group, and this is Alex Moat's group uh, in England. And because everybody had to have all the features in order to be classified with the disease, when you looked at everybody, they all had a whole bunch of features. So it was circular because they had to have a bunch of features to be included. This led us astray for a long time because we were sort of looking at the people who had the most things affected, not all of the people. So as time went on, kidney disease, blood vessels, stroke, unusual bleeding, malnutrition, bone disease, and, and fractures became standard things that we think about um, that also could be used for inclusion into the, the diagnosis. Okay, so we actually sort of talked about that without the pretty picture. So there was a period of time where allergil was felt to be a, quote, benign pediatric liver disease because mostly it was being compared to diseases like biliary atresia, with, which without, a, without any therapy is 100% fatal by two years of age, and with great therapy, is still you know, at least 50%, and until transplant, 50% fatal by two. But now with transplant, obviously, everyone has an option for a second chance, and transplant is better and better and better. But what you can see is that these are the causes of mortality, um, particularly cardiac was in mostly limited in the first few years of life to those patients who had tetralogy of fallot pulmonary atresia. I don't think anyone thinks that this is a benign syndrome, but that was a, even a title of an article. So how is it treated? Well, there are a lot of different things, and I'm not going to spend all of this time talking about treatment. You'll get some of that over the next two days, but we try to support the liver, replace the vitamin deficiencies, treat the itching, definitely, definitely uh, support uh, growth and development with nutritional therapy. If there's portal hypertension, uh, liver pressure, we treat that directly. Um, and then we have several surgical options. And really, in some ways, the, the original gene therapy for liver disease is a transplant. Take someone else's genes and also their plumbing and plug them in, and uh, that works uh, uh, quite well. There have been patients, obviously, who have had heart transplant, rarely, kidney transplant, more and more. 
um, as well, and there's been a lung and so on. Um, what signifies failure of therapy? I think this is uh, a combination of what your child tells you, uh, what the physician tells you, what uh, the liver can do. But if the liver can't do its basic functions, if it can't keep you mentally alert, um, if it can't keep you clotting at a reasonable level, if it can't make albumin, if you get ascites, that's a liver that's failing, and that's a, a sequence that needs to go forward to transplant. If you have vomiting of blood because of the pressure in blood vessels in the esophagus, many times we can control that, sometimes we can't. That's a failure. Um, if you really have significant nutritional issues um, and sometimes itching or uh, bone disease are reasons uh, to say we failed with this liver, it's time to uh, apply for a new one. Okay. Synthetic failure is something that people talk about. We said that the liver makes a lot of important things and the clotting factors, albumin. So in many diseases, the of nearly failing liver still excretes bile fine. It's the opposite of allergial. An allergial liver can do everything else great, but it can't excrete what it needs to excrete. But in different diseases, that uh, is uh, just the opposite. Um, high ammonia sometimes clouds the sensorium, clouds consciousness. Um, so that's another sign that you're failing. And then some of these things are things that we can take care of by other approaches, you know, IV vitamin K, diuretics, other things that can help to bridge these. Okay. We talk a little bit about portal hypertension. It's an issue in allergial. It's not as nearly as much of an issue as it is in biliary atresia. But if the spleen is big, it means that it's under some degree of pressure. And that pressure is in the portal system to port means uh, a door or to carry. And the, the gut has a very unusual blood flow system where the arteries go to the gut and to the spleen, and then they get into a vein, but they don't come back to the heart. The vein takes it into the liver, and then the liver has another vein that goes to the heart. So that's a, that's a sequence that is really only in two important places in the body. Um, but if that blood going to the liver gets blocked because of fibrosis, cirrhosis, things like that, then everything that's downstream or upstream pressure-wise builds up pressure, and sometimes that stretches blood vessels, hemorrhoids, varices, and so on, and that's portal hypertension. It's also what makes your platelets drop because the platelets get trapped in your spleen. So that's something we watch very carefully. Size of the liver, we're not excited. Size of the spleen, we measure it like to the centimeter. Okay, just say, um, there's gonna be a whole talk on transplant, so I'm not gonna do much, except to say that when transplant is being considered from a relative, we believe 100% you have to do the genetics because there are relatives who look normal, and then you go and you go to take out their liver, you open them up, and this has happened, this is the paper, and it turns out they have the syndrome with nothing, but then they have no plumbing in the liver that they're then gonna give to your child, and the um, you know, operation aborts, and you know. So it is, we, we believe it's really now that gene testing is so available in so many places, so reasonable a price, that Every patient should have it, and then really, in almost every situation, the parents should have it. We used to say, when it was really expensive, okay, you don't look like you have it, so don't worry about it. Or parents would say, I'm 50, I'm not having another kid. Um, but now we recognize that there are independent issues in adults who carry the gene that should be thought about. And we heard over there that nobody really has put out guidelines about how to take care of adults, but we do think it's important to know if you have a mutation uh, as a parent of a child. Okay, so you'll also hear about the genetics, but I just can't give this talk without saying, in the 80s, deletions, it was really exciting. We were like, wow, and then uh, Nancy Spinner's group uh, with Ian Krantz, 
Liz Rand, the deletions, we were thinking that they'd be in every patient. Turns out like they peaked at 6% and they never got any more than that. So we had to have a new hypothesis because our old one was wrong. We had a, a family that uh, lived near us in Philadelphia that had a translocation. We'd taken care of the family for a long time. And I was like, oh yeah, we, we used to have these Saturdays where we'd bring everybody in and draw blood and everything. And this family came in on the first one and uh, Nancy said, we got a translocation. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, oh, you don't understand. This is the answer. This is the holy grail. This is how they found the retinoblastoma gene, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, wow. And, and then in all the time, in all the years since then, what, there's like one more translocation? We're totally lucky. <laughs> Luck's good. Luck's better than bad luck. So this, uh, in 1997, I'm sure you all know, two papers back to back describing that mutations in JAG1 cause allergial syndrome, and this was a typical family. I won't go through their whole history, but it, it turns out that notch signaling I can't see at the angle, but there, is that a fly? So notch signaling was first described in uh, Drosophila, flies, and somebody said in the scientific thing yesterday, C. elegans, uh, this system's been studied in worms, it's been, you know, but never really thought much about in humans for all of this time, the notching of the wing, which is what led to the notch pathway, was discovered 100 years ago, um, but only more recently have we really understood how unbelievably important it is. And again, Nancy will talk about this. There's a notched wing. It turns out that this really is an old-fashioned telephone system where one cell has something that sticks out, and it touches the other cell. And when they touch, this cell tells this cell something really important and for a long time totally secret and then this cell goes and does something. So it's lateral specification, it's cell-to-cell -cell communication, and as best we can tell, every species, every going back somewhere, if you believe in that, we do, to evolution, way back when humans and flies must have had the common ancestor, um, we all use this. And then the amazing thing is like, Mice use it, and they don't get very excited about it in most things, but in humans, a jagged one really, as we evolved, we use it for like everything. So then right after the gene discovery, people, Kathy Looms, sitting back there working hard. Um, this is uh, Allergil's group, Celine Crosnier. They were able to show that you could find this gene active in all these different fetal tissues. It turned out to be the same fetal tissues that people have disease in. So this was kind of like proof that this unbelievable discovery actually really mattered and started to make more and more sense. I mean, even you could see it brightly in the eye and you know, in the spine and everything. It's really amazing. So now we know that this cell-to-cell -cell communication pathway is involved in the embryogenesis of a whole bunch in humans of a whole bunch of different organs um, and that it, it really matters, but the manifestations of defects in this are really very different from patient to patient. So Nancy's group, we've had the, uh, I say we, but I didn't do any of this. We had the opportunity to do mutation analysis on like 250 different families. But this started to give us the information that people were always asking. So first of all, most of the mutations are inside the gene. That makes some sense. These deletions, meaning these patients were either missing a big piece or all of the gene, never got higher than this. But this is higher than a lot of diseases, but way lower than some of the diseases that we were studying that had so many different manifestations. And then really, by 2006, we got to the point where 94% of really well-characterized patients we could find a mutation, although sometimes it took like an unbelievable number of technician hours back then and gels everywhere and, you know. But what was important as uh, conclusions about this, I think here and on the next slide, is that we, the gene detection was now better than the liver biopsy, slower, but better, but also that 60% of these were new in the baby, new in the patient. 
So that's very important information for parents who are wondering, like, will we have five children with this, et cetera? You know, and so that, uh, to me, that was tremendous. And then at a scientific level, but this is now gonna matter going forward, where are we going? It seems like having a half dose of Jagged meant that you were gonna have disease. And if you, there's one family that Nancy looked at where they were kind of like, make it up 80%-ish, and like everybody's liver in that family was fine, but they had heart disease and facies. So the dosing, seems to matter, and so the question is, if we could get the dose of Jagged to be higher, and we'll talk about this, could we do some real good? Okay, so that's what we just said, but that'll be on the, the printout. So mutation testing is now, there was a whole period of time where you could not get your genes tested, and it was really a challenge, and now you can get your genes tested anywhere, and there's really no insurance company that should be able to tell you no for this. And you can, um, uh, in the right scenario with cholestasis, uh, get it done uh, for free via retrofen at Emory. So, you know, um, it's, it's great, uh, you know, but gene testing, it's, it's no longer the state of the arts, sad to say, um, but very important. Okay, so now, um, we're just gonna expand this just very quickly. There's a girl from Florida. She had heart disease. She came up the CHOP. And you can just, since you're all radiologists by now, you can see she has pulmonary artery stenosis. She has butterfly vertebrae. She has tetralogy of Fallot. Nobody thought of it. She has Alagil syndrome and the genetics proved it. But she's a heart. This is a family that our cardiologists were following. Four generations, for those of you who've done these things, of people who had pulmonary artery stenosis. Now to us, they have facies, that's the adult facies, but not maybe, you know, but a jagged mutation, Alagil syndrome, heart predominant. So it turns out that there are many people who have manifestations that are not liver predominant, and there's some people who have no liver disease. So we've finally, as hepatologists, acknowledged that, but it's all because the gene was discovered and then the gene was applied and so we go back to this slide that we saw before. Everybody has every manifestation. So this is a study that uh, Nancy, Kathy, and Benita devised, which I think is really spectacular, and it goes back to this. I put this in quotes because of Nancy. It says, everybody who has a JAG1 have this syndrome. So what they did was they took 34 families that had an allergial syndrome and had a lot of kids or parents or something. And so they searched through these, and they found 53 relatives who had JAG1 mutations. They statistically, for reasons that I had to be convinced of, you throw away the patients, and you just analyze the relatives, because the patients obviously must be affected because they were diagnosed. So you do this study, and only 20% of the relatives would have had the diagnosis of Allergil made, and the other 80% had like minor features or no features or cardiac without liver. And so, I mean, in some ways, this, you know, like vastly expanded the spectrum of what these mutations cause. And it also, in some ways, increased the frequency of the disease fourfold because cl the clinicians are only finding the tip of the iceberg here. Okay, and that's what I said. So this is a family, and this just this is one of the perplexing things, this family a little bit outside of Philadelphia, where the first child had very critical heart disease um, that uh, was, was unstoppable. Um, the second child had fairly aggressive, regular allergial syndrome and was transplanted. The fourth child had the kind of allergial syndrome that she had it, but it never was consequential in her life. And then, obviously, when you have three kids, one parent must have a mutation. And the father actually had mostly renal disease and had a renal transplant. So here you have, in one family with the same mutation, you have renal failure, heart failure, liver failure, and nothing. And so why is that? Because they all have the same jagged gene. So a lot of people have been uh, looking at why that is, and we don't know the answer to that yet. 
No, the black circle, I don't know how to make this go backwards. The black circle, that was a, on average, if a parent has it, on average, 50% of the kids will have no jagged mutation and 50% will. So they were statistically on the side of more of their kids had the jagged mutation than not. Okay, so I'm gonna fly through these because Roberta's giving me the hook um, and that's on tape. Uh, so, uh, the different things in the notch pathway cause other diseases that many of these investigators here are very focused in. So this was described just before allergial. It's a stroke syndrome, but we also know that allergial can stroke. This is a spine syndrome with a couple different things, but we know that allergial patients have spine things. This is a heart syndrome, notch one, um, and we sort of call this left-sided heart, but we know that allergial patients have heart disease. So over time, more and more of these things have shown up that expand the importance of this pathway on human development. And then a guy named Tom Gridley in his lab made a mouse model of allergial syndrome, the first. There have been several uh, subsequent to that. But he needed to use notch two, the receiver side of the communication, to make that mouse happen. And so then uh, Nancy and her team went and they decided to look at that 6%, that annoying 6% that we didn't have a gene mutation on. But we said maybe notch two is a good place to look for a second thing. And in fact, this is a family with very typical allergial syndrome who actually had notch two as the mutation, not jagged one. So it expanded this and then uh, Benita Kamath uh, further expanded that and now there are other diseases in notch two and so on. But this is kind of the spectrum. This is notch signaling. And the most important of these diseases, not just the liver doctors and geneticists, is allergial. But all of these different diseases, and there will probably be many more manifestations in this pathway, because it just seems to really control human embryologic development. OK, I want to say a shout out word for children. Um, almost 20 years ago now, uh, the NIH started to ban uh, big centers together, first with the Biliary Atresia Research Consortium, and then the cholestatic, cholestasis, liver consortium, which included allergial. And now it's a number of other rare diseases. And I think while people are very unhappy that there's not enough research in allergial syndrome, you should hear the families who didn't get included in the grade eight, because they're like nobody's studying their diseases, and it's really frustrating. But this is great. And I'm just going to show you very quickly, if you go, these are the different centers. They do all kinds of different studies. It's the biggest collection of allergial patients ever done, although Benita is going to change that. Um, and these are some of the studies that were funded, and there are a whole bunch more on the website. You can look and see them. So in my last minutes, does everyone with allergial syndrome have a mutation in JAGED1? Nancy's going to answer that tomorrow, almost. I mean, she's going to answer it for real, but the answer is almost. Does everyone with a mutation in JAG1 have allergial syndrome? No, not if you're a purist. Um, does my child have a new mutation? We can tell that now. Does everyone with the same mutation have the same disease? You know the answer to that is no. What's the range of disease that a mutation causes? It's nearly infinite. I mean, it's like all kinds of different things. Why is it dominantly inherited? inherited because one bad copy makes you below the threshold for normal development. Should I be tested? We believe the answer to that most of the time is yes. If I am tested, what good will it do? People will talk about that tomorrow. Um, and now that the gene is known, is gene therapy coming? Yes, soon, it's complicated. Um, but, you, but you heard some people talk about that. It is very hard to do major testing in infants, and the time when gene therapy or modulating this pathway will matter to the liver is in the first months or year of life, and that's just a really tough time to safely test in humans. But half the people in that room are working on this, so you can finally say that. We couldn't say that, you know, too long ago. A lot of lessons learned. It's a very complicated, variable disease. I think you know that. Um, there are many other genes in this pathway where we don't know the disease yet, but we're going to discover more of these. Signaling is really important. It's important for flies, worms, 
mice, um, but it's really, really important to us in this room. Um, and yet, some people have a really important mutation, and they have nothing wrong. What can we learn from that? There's got to be something in that. And there are probably a lot of people out there who have very minor mutations that we just have no clue about. Will it recur in my next child? This is where the genetics can give you this information. That's really important, and Nancy will talk about that. Did you do anything to cause it? Absolutely zero, no. I mean, unless you were like the person who cleaned out Chernobyl or something, if people just saw that. But it's nothing that you did. All of us have mutations that our parents did not have. But most of those mutations are either in areas that don't matter or in areas that are recessive genes. But once in a while, once in 30,000, something like that, it's actually that's not quite the right number, Nancy's gonna yell at me, but <laughs> once in 55,000, a mutation happens in an area that matters if you only have one mutation. And that's this disease and a couple of other diseases where they're dominant and new <laughs> mutations are prevalent. What can you do to help? People were asking that. This is it. This, take out your cell phones. Take a picture of this. Get involved. Make some noise. Tell your government that kids should be covered for their medical care. Tell the NIH they should fund some research. Find the grandpa who's really rich and like make a donation to you know, the Alliance, to you know, whatever research center you love the most. If you can, join children. I can't understand when somebody like says no, they don't want to be enrolled in a children in, in just in the children, you know, database. Um, so not a confidentiality thing or anything else. Support research every way you can. The people who are doing the clinical research will tell you there are not enough patients who say yes to research for them to be able to bring new things to the table. So get involved. They didn't put me up to that slide. Uh, this is from one of the uh, 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 family, uh, international family symposia. Um, and I have to say, everything that we do as clinicians and, and as geneticists is really dedicated to all of you. Um, we've been in this for a long time, and these are uh, great things, and we've watched uh, so many of these kids uh, grow up. This one is, uh, this one is from number two. Uh, I do have to say one of the best things for me, and I'm sure Nancy Kathy Benita would say, we've had like 40 faculty members who have just been marvelous to work with. I was going to try to update them and name them, but Roberta made me do something else instead. <laughs> Tremendous number of colleagues, people have gone all over the country, worked on this. And in our center, we've had the ability, because we see so many patients, to have special cardiologists endocrinologist, neuro, neurosurge, where they really know allergial. It's not like they've seen one. They're our go-to person for everybody that comes in who has those issues. Our liver center donor family, that's one of the things that made us what we are. It was a grandpa. So somebody in here has a grandpa that can like change the world, find them. You know? Tell them you don't want to inherit their money, you want them to donate. All right, I'm going to skip that. This, so this, I think, is, I'm getting close, Roberta. She's getting. <laughs> Yeah. So these are the number of publications in allergial syndrome in sort of these first 50 years. And you can see there was like nothing, and then more and more and more and more excitement. But what really benefits um, this disease is the fact that this gene turns out to be so much more important, I would say, than any liver disease gene that there is. Um, and so if you look at the scale here, See if I, I can go backwards. This scale, I mean in life, yeah. This scale goes up to like 35 papers. This scale goes up to 1,400 papers per year on these things that you and the scientists care about. And that's where a lot of the discoveries and a lot of the NIH money will come. So what are the unmet needs? We don't have good therapy to address biodiversity. We're not really good at clearing bile salts and cholesterol. We can't predict the future and what's going to happen. Timing of transplant, you could get two totally different pieces of information. Um, there are no guidelines for care in adults, and I think we've decided this year Benita is definitely going to make 
the guidelines for adults. Um, but obviously, as, as much as PD, yeah, there you go. Um, counseling and prenatal strategies. I, I'm not going to go into this, Nancy May, a little bit, but now this is more and more challenged by the fact that in many states now, some of these strategies are just going to be illegal statewide. Um, vascular screening, got to do it, but we, again, it's anecdote driven. It's by cases rather than by good studies. We should be doing the good studies. Care really should be concentrated in places where people have seen enough cases to have a feeling about it. And insurance coverage for kids should just be universal. You know, the idea that some people are paying 300 bucks a month for their vitamins is, is really, it's not just tragic, it's wrong. Um, there are some things at a genetic basis that really have potential for the future. Normal infants make more ducts. Allergial infants seem to have less ducts. That's due to jagged and its effects. How are the scientists going to change that? And so a couple different people are working on that. It is very cool. They have to get it to work in a tube. Then they have to get it to work in a mouse. And then they have to be able to bring it to humans. But at least the first steps are now underway. Um, some other things, you know, you, you can't really detect the first child in your family with allergial syndrome. Because even if you have like a high resolution ultrasound or something, this is just so rare. You're not, we, the prevent of this is not something that's on the horizon. But it's totally possible to diagnose that child in the first month of life. Gene therapy turns around quickly, the biopsy, et cetera. And since the allergy patient has this one copy of normal jagged, and since half a dose causes the disease, it just seems that strategies to increase the expression of this gene could really make a major difference in the life, even of the first child um, that you have in the family, um, if they can get this to work. And we have to learn something from the fact that some people carry the mutation and nothing's wrong. So this is the very first family uh, symposium. I just want to, let's see who we can point out here. There's Nancy Spinner right there. Karen Emmerich was a big part of our team, Peter Whittington, hepatologist, Ian Krantz, um, Alicia Rovner. I saw, showed that. This is, uh, we do a lot of these at, at CHOP. This is a family one, a paper one right there. And this is part of our liver center team. This, uh, I uh, joked yesterday, this uh, is Kathy Benita, me, Nancy, Ian, Alicia, Betsy. And even though it's 25 years old, we look exactly like we did then. <laughs> that's it. And that's my, you got to look. If you don't look, you won't find a dinosaur. I feel like a dinosaur, but, you know. <laughs> Thank you. We're taking Thank no you. questions. It's Benita. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on.